All right. Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 21. But before we jump into that massive amount of verses, we need to discuss what we talked about last week. That way we keep everything in its proper context. Now, last week we covered Mark 2, verses 23 through 28, and then made our way into chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And, and really what we saw in those verses last week is Jesus standing up against the religious elite. And why is he doing that? Because they have added to the word of God. They've added to the word of God, and Jesus is not going to stand for it. And, and church, we need to learn from this. We, we need to understand that if there is a denomination, a religion, that has added to the Word of God, we cannot be a part of that denomination, nor can we be a part of that religion. Jesus has made this perfectly clear. You look at what they did to the Sabbath. Last week in the verses that we covered, Jesus and His disciples on the Sabbath day were walking through a grain field. His men were hungry, as so was He, because He is 100% fully human, also 100% fully God. The Lord allows for man to take from a grain field, the head of that grain, rub it in your hand, and you get the kernel out of it, and you can eat that kernel. However, according to the man-made laws of the Pharisees, Jesus was breaking the law of the Sabbath day. And we even said this last week, what kind of life must you have as a Pharisee to continue to watch Jesus and whatever he's doing, watch, walking through a grain field, there they are. Taking notes. So here Jesus looks at them. The Pharisees, that is. And he said, don't you understand the story of David and the priest in the Old Testament? Which was a slap in the face to them. But the, that simple question when David was running for his life, he had his men with him. They come to a tabernacle, and inside the tabernacle, there's the bread of presence. And after a week, a new bread of presence would be laid out, and that old bread, the priest could eat. David comes into the tabernacle, looks at the priest, and is like, my men, we're hungry. We, we had to take off. We have no provisions. It's then the priest looks at him and says, here, take this bread. You and your men feed off of it. What, what do we see here? We see that it does not upset God when man has compassion on another man who is in need and a law is broken in that sense. A ceremonial law is broken. Because that man, that compassion, that ranks over that ceremonial law. For the Pharisees, they could not handle this. And it blew their mind because they're like, look at us. They used the law to outwardly look holy, to outwardly look righteous. And I'm not, I'm going to say something here, and you guys already know this, but the church still does that today. So, so often we use the law to look holy and righteous, to make ourselves look more appealing to those around us. When we know that our righteousness comes from Christ, not by anything that we have done, not by a law in which we hold to, especially when you boast in your good works. Here Jesus is calling the Pharisees out on what they have done to the Sabbath. See, the religious elite were crushing the people with their added laws to the point to where there was no compassion, no kindness, no goodness, nor mercy. That was a problem. When you take the ceremonial laws and the rituals and you place that up here, but man's needs down here. For it was the Pharisees who were truly violating the Sabbath by turning it into a burdensome day of legalistic observance. And then Jesus, on another Sabbath day, in the synagogue, preaching and teaching, and there's withered hand man in there, and as Jesus is teaching, he sees the man with the withered hand. And what are the Pharisees thinking? Please, oh please, Jesus, heal that man with the withered hand. Because according to their law, you can't even heal someone on the Sabbath day. If you're a doctor, when you go see a patient on the Sabbath day, if you're Jewish, you know what you can do? 
You can keep him in the state that that person is in. You cannot make them better. You have to hold them in that state. Because if you make them better, that is a work that you are doing. Which says nowhere in Scripture, but to man's added laws. So here Jesus teaching and preaching, he knows exactly what the Pharisees are thinking. So he looks at the man with a withered hand and he says, come here. And you're thinking the Pharisees are like, we got him. You know, they're probably giving like a little secret high five to each other. Nobody else is seeing this, but we finally got him right here. What does Jesus say to them? Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill? That question just shut them up. Because if they say yes, it is okay to help or save the life of an individual on the Sabbath day. You know what they're saying? You're going to have to go against the very traditions, the man-made laws in which we have made up. However, if they say it's okay to do evil and or kill on the Sabbath day, then of course they're going against the law of the Old Testament. Checkmate Jesus yet again. Jesus then looks at the man with a withered hand and heals him. Now after this, the Pharisees are, are just beside themselves. They leave the synagogues, they go and meet in the synagogue, they go and meet with the Herodians. And the Herodians were a secular political group that supported Herod the Great. So you have the religious elite meeting with a secular group. Why? Because both of these groups hate Jesus and they come together to make a plan to destroy him. Okay, let's get comfortable. Verse 7. And eight together. We want to combine these two. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea, and Jerusalem and Edomea, and from beyond the Jordan, and from around Tyre and Sidon, when the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. So what we understand from this, Jesus leaves. Why is that? Because he knows that the Pharisees and the Herodians are coming up with a plan to kill him. But you know what else Jesus knows? It's not time for him to die. He's got ministry to do. He's got work to do. There is a cross that is waiting for him, and there's no way the Herodians and the Pharisees are going to come together during this time to take him out. So Jesus distanced himself from his enemies to the north end of the Sea of Galilee a more remote place, if you will. But this crowd, and when I say crowd, the word great is used twice in these two verses, twice. So when you think about that and that understanding, it's not just thousands of people. This could be tens of thousands of people following Jesus. Now, the other disciples that Jesus is going to call, they're in this crowd as well. But this is what's so sad, church. Out of these tens of thousands of people, there's only a small minority that are there to listen to Jesus preach and teach. Do you know why that is? Because the gospel is offensive. The gospel is always at work. It's going to do one of two things. It is going to soften the heart of man to where they come to believe the truth or it's going to harden the heart of man where they come to despise the truth. It is always at work. So here Jesus is, famous, people coming from all over the region. That's why Mark mentions the different geographical locations. People were coming from the south, the east, and the northwest. But it wasn't just the Jews. For Tyre and Sidon, that was a heavily Gentile populated area. So even the Gentiles are coming to listen, not to listen, take that back, are coming to see Jesus perform, I should say. Coming to see the miracles take place before their very eyes. What was the reason for the miracles, church? To validate what Jesus was teaching and preaching. That's why the miracles were taking place. And you have the tens of thousands. Our modern medicine today 
cannot do what Jesus was doing 2,000 years ago. You just think about the man with the withered hand. We're we're not certain how it happened. Maybe he was born with it. Maybe it was disease. Maybe it was an accident work. But the man's hand didn't work. And then Jesus says, you were healed, and it's perfectly fine. There's no rehab. There's no come back in two to three weeks. Let's see how it's going. Perfectly fine. He's healing the blind the deaf, the crippled, the lepers, even the demon-possessed. I mean, he brings a man back to life after four days. So, of course, people are going to be following him. You know what else is interesting about this, though? Because we have a lot of people in the world, they call themselves atheists or agnostics, who deny Jesus as being Lord and Savior. But I find this very interesting Because probably at the end of Jesus' ministry, you're talking close to hundreds of thousands of people saw the miracles in which he performed. Do you know what we do not have a record of? Someone coming out and saying, he didn't do that. Do you know why that is? Because hundreds of thousands of people would be like, wait a minute, I was there, I saw it. Think about his enemies and how they wanted him dead. They're searching for him in grain fields, taking notes. No record of the Pharisees or the Sadducees. The scribes, nothing about the miracles he performed. Jesus practically removed diseases and and any sickness from Israel. It's probably the healthiest it's ever been because of this man. Uh, we're not going to work. We're not going to make it if I don't keep moving on. Okay. The, the sad part is, though, the sad part is they were not there for his preaching and teaching. They were there for the sideshow. Now, look at verse 9. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. That's how many people were following Jesus. He has to tell his boys, guys, listen, um, I'm going to have to get in the water. We're, we're going to have to paddle out. We're going to have to paddle out just a little bit. So, so that way, the, the crowd's not going to rush in on me and kill me because everybody, everybody's wanting to just at least touch Jesus. Because just by touching him, they are healed. So there has to be some distance between Jesus and the crowd. If you will, look at... Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14. Because I said, with this crowd of people, the tens of thousands, they're not coming to to hear what he has to say, the majority of them. They're coming to be entertained because the gospel is offensive. Look at what he says right here. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. This is what's so sad about the thousands upon thousands that were coming to see Christ. Eventually, they diminished because of the very words in which he was preaching and teaching. Look at verse 10. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. I don't think we today can comprehend what's being said here. Or that understanding of this many people coming just to touch his garment. Why? Because they've been told there's no hope for you. What you have, what you're struggling with, well, we can't do anything for you. Then they hear about this man who is miraculously healing people. You better believe tens of thousands of people are going to come just to touch his garment to be healed. In first century Judaism, it was understood wrongly, but it was understood that a disease or disability was a punishment from God. 
So that young man who is struggling from birth with some type of disease sees that if he can just touch the garment of Jesus, he'll be in the right standing with God because he's healed. Even though they were thinking about this wrongly, look at how Jesus uses this, though. For many of them, their heart was going to be softened by being healed. If this man is able to heal me after everyone I've gone and talked to tells me there's no hope for you, then maybe this man is who he says he is. So you see how the Lord works in that way. So for some, not only were they healed physically, but also spiritually. Now, we can't skip over the part where it says they pressed around to touch him. That this was the healing power of Jesus. Look at Mark 6, verse 56. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many touched it were made well. Just picturing this promised Messiah walking through the streets of these cities and villages and people laying their sick out on the sidewalks just so a garment, a fringe of his garment can touch them. I don't know about you, but I I, I get so tired of hearing, really, there's no evidence that Jesus is God. His clothes were healing people because of the power that was flowing through him. There is no denial when it comes to this. Recorded evidence is right here. Yeah, but it's thousands of years old. So what? That doesn't matter, oh church. It is historical. But it wasn't just illnesses or disabilities that Jesus was able to heal and cure. Even verse 11 says, And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. The the very demons couldn't control themselves around Jesus. And they had been able to focus on destroying souls for thousands upon thousands of years. But no longer, not when Jesus was around. That they couldn't even masquerade as an angel of light in his presence. You could see someone being possessed, the family struggling with him, not certain what's going on or what to do. Jesus walks into the room. That demon-possessed person falls to the ground. The demon exits because he can't be within the same room as Jesus. That's the power flowing from him. Demons crying out that you're the son of God. Do you know why that is? Because the demons know Jesus. They were up in the heavenly realm with Jesus before they followed Lucifer and God kicked them out. They know exactly who he is. And even though they were correct theologically, and even correct in identifying Jesus, he didn't want the demons proclaiming his name. He didn't want the demons promoting him. He doesn't need testimony from Satan and his demons. That's why in verse 12 it says, and he strictly ordered them not to make him known. It's interesting, isn't it? We've grown up. Cartoons, movies, illustrations of this battle taking place between Jesus and Satan. And, and, And in these illustrations or these pictures, what what do we what do we sing? That it's almost like an even battle, right? You have Jesus standing in at five foot ten. Satan right around five ten and a half. Jesus weighing in at 185. Satan, 184 pounds. Jesus is known for his stand-up game, while Satan is known for the ground game. 
That's not how this is. You, you think about what we are seeing right here. The very demons that followed Satan cannot be in the same room with Jesus without falling out and obeying Him. But they can't do a single thing outside the decree of God. Did we grasp that? Jesus speaks. The demons listen. They see Jesus. They fall to the ground. Jesus tells them to keep quiet. And what do they do? They keep quiet. It seems, it's sad that the demons recognize who Jesus is. But the nation of Israel as a whole never truly did. And part of that was due to their religious leaders and their horrific teachings. Look at verse 13. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Now, we've talked about Mark before. Mark is a fast-paced storyteller. He just gets to the point. Now, there's something that Mark leaves out here. But we see in the other Gospels that part of the night in which he's up on that mountain praying, he's praying with the Father. That's what he's doing up there, praying to the Father. And it's after that time with the Father that Jesus chooses the rest of the twelve. Look at what John says in John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. The 12 in which Jesus chose, they didn't volunteer. Jesus sought them out. Now, I'm not saying they didn't want to be his disciples. I'm not saying that at all. But if Jesus had not chosen them, they would have never been his disciples. I'll go so far to say that they didn't even have an option when Jesus came to them. Doesn't seem like it, does it? Every time he said, follow me, okay. Following you, Jesus, laying everything down and following you. But there's something else that we cannot overlook here, church. We can't overlook this. These 12 men, they were just lay people. There was no interview process. There was no, let me see your seminary credentials. What synagogues have you worked at? No resume included. None of it. What we see Jesus doing is he's choosing 12 ordinary men to change the world. This is what I want you to hear. You do not have to have a master's to go out and proclaim the gospel. As a matter of fact, some of the best teachers and preachers don't. 12 ordinary men. These men, by the age of 12, were working for their fathers or in another type of manual labor type job. There was no rabbi that came to them and said, listen, I know you're pretty smart. I've seen your grades. I would like for you to follow me. That didn't happen with these 12. So do you know what else we're seeing here, which is beautiful in the way in which Jesus does it? He's condemning the religious elite. He's condemning the Jewish establishment by selecting these 12 ordinary men. He's telling the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, you all aren't qualified to be my disciples. Now this would have blown the world's mind because you have the most highly educated men, the smartest men who have been called to be the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and yet God, the Father, and the Son are telling them by whom Jesus chose, not you. Not you. Look at verse 14. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. 12 men. 
And that's not just an arbitrary number, church. For these 12 men represent the 12 tribes in which they'll be given the responsibility to rule and judge. Look at Luke 22, 28 through 30. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. There was a reason behind the 12. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Well, Britt, it's not, it's not all 12. You have Judas yet. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Now, back to verse 14. So these 12 men, these disciples have been following Jesus. They've been listening to him. They've been watching him heal. But it's here that he's pulling these 12 closer to himself so that he can teach them, so that he can pour into them for three years. This is what Jesus is going to do. He's taking these 12 aside so that they can learn from him. Now, just real quick, the word disciple, that only means student or follower of a teacher. So in this case, it's a student or follower of Jesus. Now, these 12 will become apostles, except, there's one, right? Um, But they'll also be named apostles. Now, apostle means messenger or one who is sent out to teach. This calling wasn't going to be easy, church. But the Jewish establishment is going to hate these men the same way in which they hated Jesus. However, these men that Jesus chose to go out into the world and to preach the gospel were going to have a tremendous impact on the world. Think about the day of Pentecost. You have Peter preaching the gospel, and 3,000 come to believe. 3,000. This layman is standing before the people preaching and teaching. Listen to me. Listen to me, church, if you will, okay? Especially the fathers, because this is extremely important. It starts at home, men. It starts at home by you pouring into your family. It starts at home by you living a godly life and your family seeing you grow in the Word of God. And from that, it pours out into the world. See, not only as a believer, fathers, are you able to go to the workplace and people see a difference in you, to have those conversations with others, or even at the ball field, but if you're raising up children, if you're raising up children, they are going to do the same thing. They're going to pay close attention to you. You know, you know, when you're thinking that your child isn't listening and and you say that one thing that you shouldn't say, what's going to be repeated at the next family dinner? (laughs) Your children are going to be watching you. But not only from there, you, you think about the desire of the woman to follow that godly man, that spiritual leader. There's nothing that's going to bring a marriage closer together than that couple being in the Word. God used ordinary men to change this world. When you think about these men, they weren't rabbis, they weren't scholars. Seven of them were fishermen. One was a tax collector, another one a freedom fighter. No formal theological education before Jesus. But after Jesus, everything changed. They laid the foundation for the Christian church. Just a side note on this word apostle and why we don't have apostles today, if you will. Like the 12 in scripture, that is. If you will, look at Acts 1, verses 21 through 26. This is talking about the requirements needed to be an apostle. They they were, of course, having to do this after Judas. Look here, Acts 1, 21 through 26. 
So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So to be an apostle, a legitimate apostle, you had to accompany Jesus. Beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So an apostle must witness the resurrection of Jesus. And they put forward to Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the reason why we do not have apostles today. It's a reason why, well, nobody is over 2,000 years old that was walking with Jesus back then. There's no one today that saw the resurrected Christ. That's part of the calling to be an apostle. So so if you're ever inside a church and, and you hear someone announce the one who is going to be speaking as, say, Apostle Daryl. You could qualify that. What what do you mean by Apostle Daryl? I mean, are are you saying that you're a messenger, you're coming to preach the good news, or are you saying capital A Apostle? Because if they're saying capital A Apostle, it's time to get your family and leave. Something else that we need to understand. No other apostles were replaced after they died other than Judas. So why didn't that happen? Because it was for a specific time, O church. Look at verse 15. And have authority to cast out demons. Now in the book of Matthew, he also adds, they were given the power to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. To be a true representative of Jesus, not only could they preach the gospel, the gospel, but they were given the ability to cast out demons and heal like Jesus as well. Why is that? Same reason, to validate what was being taught. Today, we have the full canon of Scripture. We have God's entire word. We don't need people going around healing people to validate what they are saying. You open up the scripture. That's validation. You you take what they're saying and you compare it to the word of God. That's validation. Let me just add this asterisk here, okay? I'm not saying that God still doesn't perform miracles today. He does. But we don't have certain individuals who are going around healing withered hands laying hands upon people who have cancer and killing them. Killing them. (laughs) We probably do have that. I mean, that is taking place today. But but you don't have that healing process like we had with the apostles. Freudian slip. Look at verse 16. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. Now, Peter means rock. Okay, let me, let me just hit some apologetics just for a second here, okay? The Catholic Church claims Peter was the first pope. However, that's not in Scripture. Church, it doesn't matter what people or a tradition may say or how old it is. If the word, that being the word of God, doesn't say it, then it's not true. It is true that Peter was a spokesman for the apostles, but he was not the first pope. He didn't hold authority over the apostles, nor did he hold authority over all the early churches. And we have an example of this in Scripture. Uh, Paul had to put Peter in his place over a theological issue. Galatians 2, verses 11 through 14. But when Cephas, Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. 
For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Well, there's the first pope getting told off. <laughs> and rightfully so, because he was never claimed to be the pope in Scripture. Again, Peter didn't hold any type of authority over the other apostles. Uh, let's look at a couple of verses that are often used to back up this false understanding of Peter being the first pope. I'm going to say there is no pope, not only in the scripture. I, I'm not just talking about the word. I'm talking about the understanding of the pope. The one understanding of man, one man being over the universal church. It's, it's not there. Look at Matthew 16, verses 15 through 18. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied. Pay close attention to this verse right here. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now verse eight is, 18 is often used to clarify Peter from the Catholic standpoint of being the Pope of, well, being the very first Pope. But again, look at verse 15 and 16. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's through the preaching of Christ that the church is going to be built. It's who Peter is preaching that the church is going to be built. Peter is the rock, yes, but Christ is the cornerstone. Christ is the cornerstone message on which the church is going to be built. Not on Peter, it's through Peter's words. Now, again, we, we can't blame Peter for this. That, that's not on him. So don't hold that against Peter. He had nothing to do with being called the first pope. That's all in a man-made tradition, not his fault. Now, Peter would go on preaching the good news until the day he was martyred in Rome, being crucified upside down because he didn't see himself as being worthy and being crucified in the same manner in which Jesus was. Look at verse 17. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name. Such an interesting name. <laughs> Boad, Boad and um, ah, That is sons of thunder. That, that's the good part, sons of thunder. These brothers were known to be hot-headed and judgmental. A personality trait that they needed to mortify. That's why Jesus named them that. Y'all need to get that under control, boys. These two men would continue preaching the good news until one of them was martyred. Church history tells us that James was beheaded by Herod Agrippa in the mid-40s. John, however, history tells us that he is said to have lived to an old age, dying of natural causes at Ephesus sometime after A.D. 98. He was also responsible for writing five books of the New Testament. Then we have Andrew. Now, the few times that Andrew is mentioned in the Gospels, he's delivering people literally to Jesus, literally taking people to Jesus. Church history tells us that Andrew was martyred after sharing the Gospel with the governor's wife. She came to the faith, but after refusing to deny the gospel, the governor had Andrew crucified on an X-shaped cross where he hung for two days. But that's not the end of the story. For those two days in which he was hanging, any time someone walked by, do you know what he was doing? He was sharing the gospel with them. Then you have Philip. Philip was known for being stubborn, 
who like the majority of the disciples would come to understand the full truth of Christ after the resurrection. But he didn't keep his mouth shut about the gospel either. And then we have Bartholomew. Not a lot is known about him. However, he made the list, so good for him. (laughs) And then you have Matthew, the tax collector whose life was turned around after meeting Jesus. The very man who walked away from earthly wealth after meeting Jesus. Come follow me. Okay, it's done. He chose Christ over wealth. And then Thomas, oh, the mighty doubter. We know that after Christ was resurrected, it was, it was Thomas who was like, nah, I don't believe you guys. I don't think that's right. But he ended up seeing the resurrected Christ and everything changed. For when he saw him, he cried out, my Lord and my God. And James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, again, we don't know much about these guys. And then Simon the Zealot. Simon was the freedom fighter, meaning he was an anti-Roman revolutionary, which is absolutely amazing. When you take, when you take Simon and Matthew, you couldn't have a freedom fighter in the same neighborhood as a tax collector, or there was going to be a fist fight. There's going to be a yelling match. But you look at what the faith does to these two men. They were able to lay down their differences because of their faith in Christ and they work together to share the good news. And then, Judas. Judas Iscariot. was the man who betrayed Christ. Judas was chosen by Jesus to betray him. Jesus even tells us this in John 6, 70. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet, one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Church, Jesus wasn't surprised by what Judas did. Jesus chose Judas to do exactly that. Now, this is something that is difficult for us to wrap our finite little brains around. Because we sit there and say, well, that doesn't sound fair if Judas didn't have a choice and what he was going to do. Church, Judas chose exactly what he wanted to do by way of his own sinful nature. Notice there was never an angel with a glock following Judas around saying, you're not going to believe in him. It's not going to happen, buddy. No. That's what Judas wanted. But that's also what God decreed before the foundation of the world that Judas was going to be born at this specific time. Jesus was going to choose him at this specific location to be betrayed. I I, I don't understand. That, That just doesn't make sense. What about his free will? That's a sermon in and of itself, is it not? He freely chose to do what his sinful nature wanted to do. And and I'm I'm going to come to a close here. Um, There's another question that, that probably needs to be answered. So you're saying that Judas was never a believer. That is correct. For once your heart has been regenerated, salvation is always yours. So answer me this, but Judas was part of the 12 that was going out preaching and teaching and healing people, casting out demons? Yeah. Well, how did that work? The Holy Spirit. But, but he wasn't a believer, no. 
God used this man who was going to reject the Savior to go out into the world to preach the good news, and even his words would be validated by people being healed. For what purpose? For Jesus to be betrayed by this man in which the Old Testament prophesied. When we look at these verses, we see these 12 ordinary men that Jesus taught for three years that would go out and preach a message that would change this world forever. Church, I tell you again, it's absolutely amazing what the Holy Spirit can do. When it comes to you studying the Word, looking to sound theological pastors and the sermons in which they teach and preach, the Holy Spirit will work in you. You don't have to have a seminary degree. You don't even have to be the smartest man in the room to go out and proclaim this good news that changes people from the inside out. Have confidence in the Holy Spirit working in you, O believer. Let us pray.